We bring you Dr. Jamie Good. She is presenting Fires, Floods, and Fish, Climate Change in the Middle Fork. Dr. Good developed her connection to nature by skiing in the mountains and whitewater kayaking on the rivers of upstate New York and New England. Her interest in fluvial geomorphology began as an undergraduate at Connecticut College. Uh, she completed her graduate and doctorate work at Colorado, Colorado State University. As a professional, Dr. Good has worked in varied ecosystems and hydroclimates throughout the U.S. and abroad. She has led international multidisciplinary investigations in the areas of climate change effects on stream morphology and aquatic habitat, large wood dynamics and sediment transport responses to wildfire and debris flows, and hydrologic uh, sediment transport and erosional processes in bedrock streams. Dr. Good is a project manager for Sustainable Streams, where her curiosity for riparian ecosystems drives, drives her to apply knowledge of physical processes to directly inform management, conservation, and restoration activities with broader sustainability objectives. This evening, Dr. Good will discuss wildfires, debris flows, climate change, all as agents of change in the middle fork of the Salmon River. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jamie Good. Thank you, Lynn, for that um, great introduction of reading my bio, my recent bio. Um, it sounds really good. Um, I just wrote it, so thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, it is an absolute joy to be able to come up to the saltiest out of Boise, probably selfishly to escape the heat, but really to be in a place that I feel a lot of connection to. So thank you all for being here. And thank you particularly to um, Ed Kennedy, who um, initiated the connection to um, get me up here. Um, so, what I'm going to uh, talk about uh, today is, um, can you all hear me okay? I'm just going to make sure, okay. Um, not used to having a microphone. So, what I'm going to talk about today um, is primarily uh, based on science uh, from the middle fork. But I'm going to first just start to give you a little bit more background um, of, of who I am, a little bit more um, laid back than, than the technical bio, I, I got um, really interested in rivers and really fell in love with river science as an undergraduate. Um, but before an undergraduate, I became a raft guide in Maine and a kayaker. And so my connection to the Middle Fork, and many of you probably have some recreational connections of whitewater, is partly um, related to that. So sort of a bit of a backdrop to the science that I have going on is my recreational pursuits um, and whitewater and river exploration. Um, so I spent some time over the last uh, decade in Boise working at the Rocky Mountain Research Station, uh, working with a large group of scientists that are continuing to do work in the Middle Fork Salmon. And what I'm going to talk about today is largely based on uh, work that I've done with them and work that they all continue to do. And so none of this is completely my own, um, and that needs to be properly acknowledged. Um, it's great to have an opportunity to dig back into this and think about it again because I've sort of shifted a bit in my career from being a research scientist to an academic and now to a practitioner in stream restoration and ecosystem um, engineering, essentially. So um, with that, um, the Middle Fork, why the Middle Fork? Um, as, as many of you know, it's a great place um, to be. Um, how many of you have had the opportunity to float the Middle Fork in white water? Yeah, how many of you have hiked into the Frank Church? Right? This is a, I'm speaking to the, the right audience here. Um, so we know that the Middle Fork is a special place, and we also know um, that the ecosystems are, are special for many other reasons. Um, so I need to also kind of acknowledge a few, a few things first that I talk about climate change and fish. One, I'm not a climate scientist, and two, I'm not a biologist. I am a geomorphologist. So what I'm going to focus on is on the physical habitat and the processes that shape that. Also, I'm assuming that on the fronts of your minds coming to a talk like this, you're probably thinking of some high, uh, highly relevant issues uh, related to our fisheries and, and fish stocks here, which one being the um, Mike Simpson's, uh, Congressman Simpson's um, recent proposal for the Northwest Plan and a removal of the Lower Snake River dams. Of course, the out-of-basin um, uh, issues are a major driver in our fish that we have here in Idaho, but I, I'm not going to talk about that, but of course that's, I'm sure, looming in the backdrop of all of your minds. 
Um, the other one, of course, is um, with climate change is our recent heat wave. And if you saw the recent news, of course, um, the Northwest, fortunate here a bit here in Stanley, in the mountains to be buffered by it. But the recent heat wave, 27 scientists recently came out with a rapid assessment to basically say that it's climate change and we would not be having these types of heat waves without that. So just kind of want to also address that before I point forward. So geomorphology, um, as a geomorphologist, what I tend to do and what geomorphologists do is we look at the landscape. So you're driving in your car, you look at a hill slope, you look at a valley, you look at a stream and you ask the question, why does the stream look the way that it does? Why is that mountain steep the way, the way that it is? And then how does this in turn affect things like aquatic habitat and maybe potentially infrastructure like roads and bridges and dams and such. So when we think about the landscape, kind of we'll start to big picture here in geomorphology, we conceptualize the way processes work at this really high order scale and use that to kind of cascade down into a smaller and smaller scale where we can eventually look at what might be relevant to a, um, an individual organism, a salmonid for example, um, or even an entire population across a watershed. And um, Sianna Swartz, one of my former students in the College of Idaho is here, and she, would, she could say that one of the things that I've always told students is the answer to every single question in geomorphology is what's driving it, it is climate and tectonics. So at the highest order scale, what's shaped our streams and what's shaped our basins is the climate. And that's the climate legacy, the recent changes in glaciation, so the valleys that we see here, the geology, how hard is the rock, what type of rock do we have, um, what's outcropping from the hill slopes, and then also the tectonics, so what types of fault systems are there. And that kind of gives us this high order template to start to um, zoom into the stream and examine what is actually controlling what's going on at this reach scale, or the scale that you would think about if you went out to, um, to Valley Creek or the Salmon and looked at a section of pools and ripples and had some questions about that. So we take this higher, higher order view, and it's a hierarchy of physical processes that, that, that cascade down into the stream. And it's those types of features, the climate and the tectonics and the geology, that predict and control what we see in the watershed, one watershed over another. So the topography, the slope of the valley bottom, the width of the valley bottom, um, also, the types of vegetation, so are you in kind of a willow type of stand, a wide alluvial valley with willows, or is it a tight, confined uh, stream with lots of um, deciduous or coniferous trees that could be input to the stream. So also, the stream flow is determined by these higher order controls. What type of um, precipitation do you get based on elevation and temperature? So is it snow or is it rain? What is the timing of stream flow? in a given year, what is the magnitude of stream flow, all of these factors are controlled by this higher order um, climate and tectonics. And then also the sediment regime, so how much sediment is going into the streams and where is it coming from and also what size is it. So taking this kind of geomorphic concept, these are factors that then cascade and see what we have at the reach scale and what might be important to fish habitat, for example or if you're a recreationalist, where you're going to find the best fishing hole, or if you're interested in where the rapids are forming and where bedrock is outcropping and such. So as fluvial geomorphologists, another way that we kind of conceptualize and um, think about how landscapes change is in fluvial geomorphology, which my, my parents still don't know what it is that I do when I tell them that I'm a fluvial geomorphologist, but it is essentially the study of how landscapes change in response to flowing water and rivers. So how water moves dirt at the simplest terms. So as a fluvial geomorphologist, the, the first thing that we can think about is this sort of balance. And um, often I tell students that it is the fluvial scales of justice, where on, on one side of this balance, and it comes from a diagram um, from um, a, a civil engineer, Lane, in the late 50s, um, that coined this, this term, and it's basically a concept that puts the driving forces on one side of the balance against the resisting forces on the other side. So what are those driving and resisting forces in the stream? Well, what's driving the stream to either cut into the landscape or move and erode laterally across the valley are the energy terms. So 
the stream flow, how much flow is in the river the or the discharge in a given year, at a given time, or, or, and duration. Also on that driving force side is the slope. So the steeper the channel, the more energy, the more flow, the more readily that that material, if it's loose, can move through a system. The other side of this balance is what's resisting that um, those driving forces. And that those resisting forces are in kind of in the sediment term. So not just the amount of sediment, so how much is being delivered to the stream. And then on the other side, how can those flows and that energy actually transport and move that material through. But also the size of the material. So are we looking at a steep and confined boulder bedded stream, which might be steep but might not have the right discharge or high enough flows for its, its watershed area to transport that material. And one thing that I'll talk about here is to expand on this kind of conceptual balance of discharge and slope versus um, sediment size and sediment amount is also wood in streams. And many of you that have been in landscapes here know that wood is quite important for aquatic ecosystems. Um, and if you are a skier also or a rafter, you've seen um, this material come down in avalanches and move into um, river systems. So that's sort of the, the, the basic background of, of geomorphology. And we can use these concepts and this balance to kind of interrogate um, the landscape and also the stream and ask questions like, well, what happens if we change one of these terms? If we increase, if the discharge increases or the sediment supply increases, how will the stream respond? And then how will the stream respond in terms of salmon habitat, in terms of its physical form? So will it get wider? Will it get deeper? Will the slope of the stream change? Will the sediment size change? And of course, those things at that reach scale over several hundreds of meters play out in terms of habitat availability. So on to climate. Um, as we know, I many of you all know that it is getting warmer, um, and the science shows that, and um, temperatures are increasing. And what we expect for temperatures globally um, averaged by the um, end of the century by 2100 is about a 4.3 degrees Celsius increase in temperature globally averaged. And that, that global average is important because as we know that it varies across um, in different places. And in, in mountain regions like this, it's going to, we're seeing um, particularly larger uh, amounts of variability in those temperature changes. So taking that global average temperature, it depends on where you are in terms of the mountains, it depends on where you are in terms of the latitude, whether you're closer to the equator or towards the poles, or how close you are to a large body of water. And this all gets into um, atmospheric circulation, uh, which we won't go into. But essentially, it's getting warmer and precipitation is changing. So we're getting different amounts of snow and rain, and the timing of that is also changing. So as a geomorphologist, and then someone that also thinks about fish habitat, what, how does that then play out? Well, the temperature is increasing stream temperatures, which is important for some eyes, but we won't talk about that. The variability in um, the amount and timing of precipitation and the amount of snowpack. As you know here in the western U.S., snowpack um, and the amount of water contained in the snowpack is really pretty much how our lives are, are dependent on it. Our infrastructure, our water resources, our irrigated agriculture, all of these human systems that we've developed with over the last century have been built around this fairly reliable snow melt curve where we have water stored up in the mountains and then over a period of time it gradually melts out, runs down downstream and we can collect it in reservoirs and use that for irrigation. Well, that timing of that snow melt, the, the size of it and when it occurs, is also really important for the aquatic organisms in these systems. And they, like everything in nature, have adapted their timing of things like spawning, um, like emergence um, from, from fish to invertebrates. All of that is based partly on temperature in the water, but also partly on the amount of flow and the timing of that. So that's sort of one kind of piece of the story to um, hold on to here. In terms of um, fish, and that's, there's more to talk about in terms of climate, but that's where I'm just going to leave that here. Um, when we think about fish um, in this region, aquatic, uh, or our anadromous species, our Chinook, as you know, um, 
are quite special. They um, swim, I, which I, when I first started studying these, or, these organisms, I was just blown away uh, by their, what they do. Right? Now, not only do they transition from saltwater to freshwater, but they, ch but they are swimming a vertical mile, nearly, up to 6,600 6, feet in some places through a gauntlet of dams, which again is a side note that we're not going to talk about here. Um, but also that they are going over 800 to 900 miles. So this area, this, the fish in this region are special. And many of you probably know um, Russ Thoreau, who is a biologist with the Rocky Mountain Research Station. I've had the fortune um, to work with him. He is the expert on uh, the Chinook and the Salmonids in the Middle Fork Basin. So I'm, I'm any questions about that, I'm just going to defer to him later on. Um, but the, the fish are, are, are important, they're special. Other things about their biology that I can, I can say as a geomorphologist, they require cold temperatures, and they're, they bury their eggs in the stream gravels. The female digs out a, a nest or a red, the male comes, fertilizes it, and then um, the eggs incubate in the gravels over the course of the season, depending on the fish, all different types of fish spawn over different time periods and emerge at different time periods. And they also bury their eggs at different depths um, into the stream gravels. And that's fairly important depending on where you are in the network and the size of the fish. So how this kind of comes back into um, geomorphology, I'm going to frame this into that balance. And that balance of how changes in stream flow, timing, and changes in sediment supply, and then also wood are changing in our climate system. So first with um, flows, well actually let me step back a moment, the middle fork. We know that the middle fork is special, but it is also special from an ecological standpoint because of the fish, which I've just described, but then also geologically and geomorphically the middle fork has a lot of really interesting things going on. As a geologist, the, uh, the types of rock change from the Idaho batholith and the granitics that we kind of find up here and you start to transition into parts of the eastern part of the basin that are chalice volcanics, differences in erosional um, and resistant strength, differences in valley composition, slightly slight differences in um, some structure and some faulting, as many of you know from many of the hot springs in there. Um, and then as you get down farther into the basin, it's very steep and confined into a passable canyon where it gets into the belt. Um, uh, the, the metamorphic belt sediments and they're much more resistant gneisses and schists. So a lot going on geologically and then an interesting place to study there for. It's also interesting and different because higher up in the network where many of the fish, the Chinook in particular, are spawning are in these wide alluvial unconfined systems. And this channel confinement, this valley width, is a really important feature in our landscape. And Pretty much what I'm going to tell you in this talk and continue to tell you is probably something that you already know, and it is the Middle Fork is special. And it is special for um, its geology, its geomorphology, its ecology, but also in the way that it has the capacity to buffer some of these potential um, changes related to climate. So in these wide alluvial valleys in the upper parts of the basin that, that look fairly similar um, to what we're looking at here in the upper parts of the salmon, and um, in Valley Creek. And if you ever have a chance to go into uh, the Bear Valley Creek um, area while the Chinook are spawning right quietly, look at them, um, it's quite incredible. Um, but as a geomorphologist, this is interesting too because typically we think about how streams behave in the network in terms of where they start in the headwaters usually are steep and confined and as you move out across the basin they get wider and they can disperse floods more readily. But here we have kind of a little bit of a flip to that where upper parts of the watershed actually have these wide, unconfined valley systems. So I'll, I'll kind of get back to that in a bit. Um, other reason why the Middle Fork is a special place and a special place to study really is that it's relatively removed from other human impacts outside of climate change. Um, there are a few legacy effects of some mining. There's a, a, some, some roaded area within the basin, but for the most part, it is a um, remote wilderness um, area that allows us to look at things like how climate change will change habitat dynamics and wood inputs without other effects like roads and dams and other human infrastructure. So three things about, about that balance in the middle fork. One is flows and how are the flows changing. 
What um, folks at the Rocky Mountain Research Station have shown and many models are showing is that the predicted stream flow maximums will increase over the coming um, century and coming decades. So models that come from downscaled large climate, climate models that we then that are then taken by people that are smarter than me and bring them into other computer settings and then predict what we get for, for stream flows. We take those data and predict what we get for annual maximums and other statistics that are important to fish, particularly during the spawning period. So flows are increasing and are expected to increase, which if you were spent any time on the rivers this year or are, that might sound bizarre to you given the relatively low year. But as we know with climate change, what we can really expect is variability in a lot of these things. Even though there may be a shift in the mean, it's the variability that is the, of most interest and most change. So also the low flows are getting lower and are predicted to get lower. So what does that mean uh, for fish? So of course, different species are spawning in different parts of the stream network. There are different sizes, so that size gives them different advantages or disadvantages in terms of how deep they can bury their eggs. And what we are concerned with is in a changing climate, as that erosive force, that discharge on the balance increases, will that have the capacity to scour the stream bed and therefore put these salmonid eggs at risk of mortality? And so we have to look at the, the stream flow hydrograph in terms of its timing. So not only do we have an increase in magnitude, but there's a shift in the, the timing of those high flows. Again, back to variability. So with warming temperatures, decreased snowpack, more rain on snow types of events, the implication is that higher flows are seen earlier in the season from these rain on snow types of events. If you're like a Chinook or a bull trout and your eggs are in the stream bed during this time and have not yet emerged, this could potentially be um, a problem, which is pretty much what we found um, by taking um, downscaled climate models and applying these to decades of, of research and field-based uh, studies in the Middle Fork. But it also depends on where these fish are spawning in the network. So fall spawners could be at risk, but the Chinook are a large part of this population is spawning in these wide alluvial valleys in Bear Valley Creek. So not only do they have the buffer of temperature, which, uh, which Dan Isaac and other folks at the Rocky Mountain Research Station have just been showing that they're relatively buffered because these places are gonna pretty much remain fairly cold in future scenarios. But also in those high flow events, what happens in these unconfined valleys is as the stream flow increases, it reaches the top of the banks and can spill out and dissipate across the floodplain. Whereas in these confined valleys, steep and confined valleys, which make up a large portion of the stream network where other fish are also spawning, that creates a scenario where the flows, as it increases, it creates more and more erosive force because it stacks up and can no longer dissipate across the floodplain. So that's the kind of geomorphically one of the more interesting features of changes in, in flow. So context matters and fish species then matters. And the geology matters also quite a bit because some of our predictive functions of what we expect for the types of pools and riffles and uh, size of sediments also varies depending on the type of geology, with the talus volcanics being a potentially more risky um, setting. So that's one of the story of flows. So let's move on to the other side of the balance, and that is sediment. So what's happening in our warming climate, as you know, uh, it's starting to get a bit smoky, is we're seeing greater and greater occurrence of wildfires, greater extents, larger severity, larger frequency. And what wildfires do across the landscape um, in response is you lose that root cohesion on the hill slopes, and you lose the interception of the rain and snow from the, the, the trees themselves, and so following a large convective storm or rain on snow event, the hill slopes are relatively weak and they, they fail and they, they bulk themselves up into these debris flows or folks that know the middle fork well are often referred to as blowouts. Um, and these, are, they, they, these debris flows deliver large amounts of sediment, particularly in the Idaho batholith that is essentially like a sandbox in many places. This granite, is, it just breaks down very easily. And this material makes its way into this, this stream network. So thinking about sediment, as we increase the sediment supply from debris flows, that has consequences to fill in the uh, stream bed below. And 
when we see these things, and a lot of a lot of people's initial reactions to these is that they're destructive. Right? If they are, if they are actually technically called in ecology, they're called disturbances. Um, but these disturbances are important, and they are part of the natural landscape. And the fish here have evolved to them. The salmonids across the Pacific Northwest, from fires to floods to earthquakes to to glaciations to volcanoes, these species have evolved and adapted. And they've adapted their biology such that they have this portfolio of a range of different ways in their life history to accommodate for these disturbances. So even if one population is hit by a debris flow in one part of the basin, there are parts of the stock that have a different sort of genetic assemblage and, and other parts that are still out in the ocean that can accommodate for these disturbances in the short term. But what um, others have shown, and, and Russ Thoreau in particular, is that after these events, you start to get a change in the stream morphology and such that it, in some cases, the sediment um, that, that comes in actually changes the slope of the channel, so back to that balance again, and upstream where it was formerly too steep for spawning gravels has now become a pool riffle type of environment. We've seen this in Pistol Creek, for example, and many of the tributaries throughout the Middle Fork Basin. And then downstream, um, eventually these things recover. The debris flows are very dynamic, and they happen quickly, and they also recover fairly quickly. So after the recovery of a, of a debris flow, these channels in central Idaho are so steep and confined that they have a lot of stream power, this discharge and slope, to move this material through. So the sediment is important for fish, it creates more habitat, it brings in the type of type and size of spawning gravels that they need. And from that, many researchers have, have basically said that if not for these debris flows, there are many sections of the network that would be too coarse for spawning to occur. So they really create habitat, even though they look fairly destructive on the surface. Ecologically, they also bring in nutrients to these nutrient depleted, depleted streams. And students that I had working with me at the College of Idaho show that at time since fire, after initial fire, there was a, um, a a few several years later, kind of this maximum, so initially it's sort of destructive and you have a limited amount of things like macro invertebrate assemblages and those populations are low. The stream morphology and complexity terms of so things like more pools and ripples and more variation in size are creating more cover for fish. Those types of complexity metrics are, are low initially, but then a few years after the stream starts to recover and they become quite high and then they sort of tail off. So these debris flows, they deliver lots of sediment, they create good spawning habitat. Um, so this is all kind of good for the salmonids and the, the fish in these basins. But another part of the sediment story is what happens when it goes downstream. Uh, many of these rivers, like I said, they're steep and confined. And when we apply our sediment transport equations that are physically based to the size of material that's coming in, we basically show that these streams can just blast this material through. And we're talking about sand-sized material that eventually makes its way down into the salmon, replenishing many of those beaches that, that people quite like on the main salmon river system, but then eventually making its way down to our infrastructure farther downstream in the network. So part of the, the, the take-home of this, this part of this story of sediments is that fires are continuing to occur. They're becoming more um, extant and more severe. Debris flows post-fire deliver more sediment fine for the fish, but as it, that material gets excavated and moves downstream, potentially not so good for infrastructure like dams and levees. Um, many of these are also occurring in places where that are wilderness areas. So with the question of, well, what can we do about it? Um, well, nothing. Um, and potentially do something about maybe road sediment that is important or is problematic for fish at different stages of their lifestyle because it's not delivered in these big pulse inputs, but it's kind of chronically bled out over um, the course of many years. So that's sort of the, the sediment um, story. And then the last kind of piece of this in this balance, which wasn't really initially opposed by the civil engineers, but Lane and many others, was the input of wood. Um, and as geomorphology, as a, as a science, and civil engineering even has sort of seen this big surge in, in, in the interest in wood and streams, both from an ecological standpoint, um, but also from a hydraulic standpoint. So wood in streams does several things. It creates good habitat. It slows down the flow. Um, 
but it, it also then creates resistance, and so I would argue that it belongs on this resistance side of this of balance equation. Thinking about the middle fork, just a quick little aside, woods maybe not so good in a lot of places. Um, if you've ever floated Marsh Creek in the early season from before the Boundary Creek Road is not open, there's quite a bit of wood in there, um, and it can be quite dangerous for boaters. I had my own um, close encounter with a pin situation on Marsh Creek this spring. Um, so while I love wood from a scientific perspective, I completely understand and appreciate the recreation um, side of this. And this is important in the middle fork, of course. There's an entire massive industry of recreation and tourism that revolves around floating the middle fork. Um, several of you might remember the, the debris flow that came in to Pistol Creek. Um, and stranded many rafters in there. So there's a, a question that I don't have an answer to, but wood in rivers is, is controversial, um, and especially in these wilderness environments from a recreational um, standpoint. The other thing that wood is doing in many of these systems is coming in from the debris flows, but it's also coming in from snow avalanches. And one of the really cool things that's, that's happening is they, as the, when we have a snow avalanche that's delivering all of this wood from the hill slope, it kind of jams itself into the middle of the river. And it's come in at a time of flow where the stream flow and that driving force doesn't have the erosive capacity to move it downstream. And it basically creates a dam. But not the type of dam that we really care about. We're concerned about the type of dam that actually might be good for fish because what it does is it starts to stack up more wood upstream and then that changes the slope and promotes the deposition of finer or coarse enough um, gravels for proper spawning habitat. So the combination of wood and debris flows is um, beneficial to creating more um, habitat for salmonids. So kind of to, to wrap this up and to put it all together, um, we think about geomorphology and how channels might change in a future climate and thinking back to this balance. Um, I would argue that the, it is, we need to think about flows and their erosive capacity but it's really also the, the sediments and the wood combined and how these all play out. So there may be scenarios where our flow predictions may say that increased flows could be detrimental for, for scouring um, spawning habitat, but if that's balanced by the input of sediment supply and the retention of wood, the two could potentially offset one another in this scenario of this balance. Of course, there are quantitative tools that geomorphologists and engineers use to predict these uh, but of course, I'm not going to give you the equations that go along with that. <laughs> spam. That's the equation. Yep, that was the equations calling um, from spam. Um, so, so all three things together um, play out into what we see on at the reach scale for um, uh, predicting salmon habitat. And then leaving you really with something that um, you probably knew already is that the middle fork is a special place. Um, and it continues to be a great place to work. Um, it inspires um, not only research questions, um, but it also is a great place for um, solitude and getting in back to connecting with nature. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions, and thank you for listening. Yeah. Jamie, um, with the, the increase in severe wildfires, potentially creating more spawning habitat. There's already an abundance of good quality spawning habitat in the middle fork. Do you think we'll actually see an increase in the in the the, the amount, the quantity of good spawning habitat because the wildfires and more recently earthquakes? Yeah, yeah, great question. So just to sort of re re repeat that that with the um, increase in wildfire that there might be more spawning habitat, more potential spawning habitat, yes. And the, the problem, of course, that is lingering behind all of this is it, you can build homes for fish and the habitat could be there, but you need fish. Um, and so it's, it's, it's positive in, in the future um, for Chinook in particular because the, the habitat's there. Um, and especially if these scenarios kind of play out in a way that it creates more potential habitat and their thermal refugia that allow um, fish that may be um, not able to tolerate lower down in the basin that could actually move to. So, yes, it's highly possible that we need to get them here. And Clara, another fish population question. I know most of the uh, Chinook that survive in the Villafork Basin are spawning in tributaries. They're spring Chinook, <coughs> Marsh Creek and Bear Valley Creek and Loon Creek and Big Creek and those places. 
the decline seems to be most severe in the main stem middle fork for summer chinook. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious what you see as the outlook for uh, additional spawning habits in the, in, the, in, the, in the main stem that would help solve that problem in addition to the out-of-basin problems. Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. And as, as someone that floats the main, the main stem salmon often, I and recently seeing all of the flags that the Forest Service has up for designating where reds are for boaters. Um, I wonder about that often a lot. Um, and I think given the way it plays out in the tributaries where wood is supplied to the, the stream and that kind of creates a feedback to create more habitat, I, I'm not so sure. These fish, they're, they're resilient and, and they really don't care that much about us, to be honest, I, I, I think. So, I mean, I think you have to be, in, in some cases, you have to be a really bad boater to go across some of these reds, so I don't think that's maybe the issue. Um, I, I really do think that the bigger issue is um, is that the we, we, we we cut the wood out and we let and and the river and the main stem river is also um, it's it's highly competent. It's a bigger system, so even if there is a large debris flow and wood that can jam and dam up the channel for a period of time. It's, it's a pretty pulsed types of events, um, and that really also kind of gets to the question of it's in a, in a changing climate with more fires and with more sediment coming into the system. You know, as a whitewater boater, I might be sad that some of my rapids might go away, but um, that change in slope could actually create more habitat if there's more sediment, not just wood. Yeah, sorry. If you uh if you try to apply your science, the data and the formula, to the removal of the state dams, what does that suggest? Uh, it suggests they need to come out. Um, <laughs> um, but, um, I will... I first started my postdoc from, from Colorado and I was asked by my supervisors um, how I would feel if I was working on a project that was that the science showed um, something that maybe I did not necessarily believe in. Um, so there's, I've taught environmental studies at the College of Idaho before, so there's a lot of, kind of human elements to all of this. Even as a researcher, even as a scientist, it's sometimes hard to keep your kind of, kind of personal bent out of all of it. Um, but going into that with the idea that it's, I'm going to do good science, and whatever the story is, is the story. Um, the end of that is that there's a lot of sediment coming in from the upper parts of, of the basin. And then it's not just that the fish aren't coming up, it's that the viability of the infrastructure downstream is a pretty limited lifespan given the, that situation. And of course, while we have changes in hydrology and droughts and lack of hydropower development because of lower reservoir levels and the increase in renewables, all of those kind of, the science is there and yeah, it's time to change. Now, my question is similar. I'm an Oregonian, so I don't understand a lot about the controversy on removing the dams. It seems to me there are five or seven of them. Four. Um, four? Well, there are eight total, four in the Columbia and four in the state. Okay, thanks. Um, will, what will removing them, uh, how will that impact the spawning um, and the, um, the continuation of the population of the Chinook in particular? Yeah, and that's that is that is the question, right? So removing the four four snake river, lower snake river dams, which are the ones that are in question, and there there are four on the Columbia as well. Um, the big issue for the the fish survival is not the adults necessarily getting up; it's the survival of the smolts as they um, go out to sea and then become adults because of the changes in the, the water temperature is warmer. There's um, slower flow. It takes them a lot longer to get through the system. And then eventually, even if they do get through the system, they're, they're weakened and stressed and become more prey to organisms that are sitting in the estuary environment. So the, the fish story is, is clear that, yes, if you take them out, then the fish will be able to move downstream. But of course, it's a lot more nuanced than that. And, and we've built an entire irrigated agricultural system and transport system and energy system around these dams. So uh, the way that I kind of first saw um, um, Congressman Simpson's proposal is, is, is not just a removal of dams. It's a reimagination of how we do life in the Pacific Northwest. And it's really you know, moving us away from this antiquated system that, um, that it's just, if we hold, the longer we hold on to it, the harder it is going to be for not just for the fish, but for our irrigated agriculture 
and for the economies that kind of rely on that in the systems. Uh, you used the term refugia. I, I can't say it very well. But refugia, I think of the Sawtooth Valley uh, as being refugia for the water and for the fish. And the Middle Fork, where I've been in there for 42 years now, uh, there's less and less potential for refugia as more and more and more of that country burns up and the temperatures in, in that area get higher and higher and the water temperatures get higher and higher. And so I, I really am concerned about how much of that country has burned. I what your thoughts are. Yeah, so refugia just uh, um, is, is, a, is basically hiding places for fish and places where that they can, as, as, um, as juveniles, as fry, that they can kind of take um, refuge in cooler water, typically, uh, but also hide from predation. And so as if you, when, when you burn the nearby riparian um, ecosystem, the effect of shading on the stream goes away and you get warmer temperatures in um, the river environment. What's also then interesting in the middle fork, though, is that you get higher up in the basin and you get into many of these willow-dominated systems in the open um, uh, Bear Valley Creek type complexes, and that doesn't have the shading um, in many places. There's some loca local local spots of, of riparian trees, but um, a lot of places there are wide open and the, and the flows are quite shallow, but it stays fairly cold there at night. Um, and that's another kind of part of this climate story is that the change not only in, in average temperatures and variability, but the change in the minimum temperature. So the change in the, um, our, our minimum temperatures, even in the summer, in summer particularly, are rising. So we wake up first thing in the morning, um, before the sun, it's the coldest time, those temperatures are increasing. But it's also those temperatures that keep the river system cold. Um, other components of that um, cold water uh, refugia question um, happened to do with the uh, the nature of the substrate in the stream bed. So as um, stream flow is not just flowing across the riverbed, it's actually interacting with the subsurface quite a lot. Um, so as the um, riverbed kind of moves up into the end of a riffle, it creates um, energy that forces some of that flow underneath the stream bed into the gravels. And that's actually really important for oxygenating a lot of the eggs that are buried in there, but it's also really important for um, keeping water temperatures cool. So even though the region may have, we might see um, lack of um, these temporal refugia because of lack of shading, it's possible that changes in the sediment supply could change the, um, the stream bed enough to change that, what's called the hyperia flow or that subsurface flow. So great question. <laughs> the salmon evolving as climate changes? That is the question as well. Um, so we can make all of these predictions about how the physical environment will change and we can also make predictions about how maybe our, um, our um, connection to that or our infrastructure might change to allow them this sort of other chance. But what we don't know is, is that we don't know if they, if they will be able to continue to adapt and change and the speed at which they can change. So yes, they have evolved in this very dynamic, rapidly changing um, environment, and they do have a lot of um, biological complexity kind of embedded in their, um, uh, uh, in their biology, which allows them to kind of hedge for these changes. But if the population goes down, even if you have a, a good kind of asset portfolio, don't have a lot of money, it might not really matter what the market's doing. You just have to have a lot more. Um, so that's part of the unknown. Oh, one in the back. The amount of fires and the dioxin levels in the river? Um, I'm not an, um, an ecologist that or a, a biogeochemist, but yes, so one of the things that I could tell you um, about fires and the, the nutrient composition um, is that most of these streams are, are nitrogen limited and limited for a lot of um, fundamental NPK nutrients um, and also carbon. So what fire does do is that it, in these post-fire debris flows is it brings in um, the, the hill slope nutrients and it sort of supplies that to the local ecosystem. So typically you see these kind of hot spots of 
biotic activity after these types of events. In terms of um, uh, the um, oxygenation and oxygen um, in the, the stream gravels, if that's um, if you're creating more variability in the subsurface topography and more gravels, more more spaces for that water to kind of flow in, there's more potential for for recharge. Uh, but dioxin, I don't know.